On the 23rd of April 1993, Belgium, at the heart of Europe, became a federal state. It's now made up of three regions, the Flemish region, the Brussels region, and the Walloon region, which in turn is made up of five provinces. There is one city which has had a particular impact on the history of the Eno province, the city of Tournai. Rising high above the city are the five clock towers which crown Notre Dame Cathedral. They each have a name, Brunin, Trey, Pontoise, Saint-Jean and Lanterne. The people of Tournai are extremely proud of this symbol of their city, which extends beyond Belgium. Tournai and its cathedral go back a very long way, nearly 1,500 years and counting. The building you can see today dates back to the 12th century. It was during the reign of the Frankish king Childeric that Tournai became a bishopric. Of the first bishops of Tournai, the best known is saint Eleuther, who presided over the church of Tournai at the beginning of the 6th century. It was the presence of bishops which gave rise to the construction of a cathedral, and this, together with the Notre Dame Church, the baptistry and the bishop's house, formed an episcopal grouping of the sort found in most cities during that period. Further buildings were added on to the structure, until in the middle of the 11th century, everything was destroyed by fire, giving way to a magnificent new construction, which has been partly preserved. A number of factors contributed to the success of this new undertaking. The development of the cult of the Virgin Mary, the wealth of Flanders, of which Tournai was the religious centre, and also worth mentioning the success of the September procession, first instigated in 1092. Last but not least, there was a desire to speed up the process of separation from the Noir diocese, which Tournai had been attached to since the 7th century. It's difficult to put a date on the Romanesque parts of the cathedral. There are texts referring to a consecration which took place in 1171 in the presence of the Archbishop of Reims and a large number of prelates, but there is no indication of the state of the construction at that point. One particular text alludes to the fact that in 1198, Bishop Etienne purchased, for a 10-year period, the rights to the income from the taxes due from transporting goods on the River Scheldt. Part of this money was used to construct the vaults and the vertical sections of the transept. Archaeologists place the construction of the nave before the transept in the first part of the 12th century. It's difficult to know exactly how the construction of the transept evolved, but what seems clear is that the initial plans already included the vaults. The construction seems to have gone ahead at a pace, at least until it came to the towers, which seem to have been finished off one by one, probably going from one bell tower to the next. The four-level design, with the distinctive triforium going all around, was highly innovative. It was at the end of the 12th century that Bishop Etienne of Orleans commissioned the St. Vincent Chapel and had the vaults added to the transept and the choir, thus introducing Gothic architecture to Tournai. One of his successors, Gautier de Marville, very greatly impressed by the Gothic cathedrals he had seen in France, decided to have a new cathedral built. Work began around 1242 and went on for some 10 years. The choir is typical of the period. Technical developments in the building industry had made it possible to envisage increasingly large-scale projects, and the cathedral was extended both upwards and outwards, a gigantic glass structure with light flooding in. The work was never to be completed, however, and Gautier de Marville's Gothic dream was never realised, either for financial reasons or perhaps simply because such large-scale constructions went out of fashion. During the following centuries, no major changes were made to the cathedral. In the 16th century, a huge Gothic window was added to the west face, and various modifications were made in the course of the 17th and 18th centuries, according to tastes at the time. After the French Revolution, the cathedral was closed and pillaged. There were even thoughts of demolishing it. When it was finally restored to the people of Tournai in 1801, it was in a truly appalling state. Restoration work started in 1840, going on for some 10 years. The restoration brought to light the Roman capitals and the Triforium, which had been totally obscured by a layer of rough cast.
At the beginning of the 20th century, the buildings surrounding the cathedral were demolished, which greatly opened it up. In May 1940, the cathedral was bombed, destroying the Notre Dame Chapel, one of the stairways in the West Gallery, and the roof of the nave. One particularly striking feature of the cathedral is how it has, over the course of these many years, continued to carry out its five different main functions. In the first instance, there have been its primary functions as a place of worship and a diocese. It's the place where the liturgy is celebrated, where the September procession is held, where priests are ordained, and the venue for the annual synod. Then it has always had a social function, representing solidarity with the people. It's the place where basic provisions were distributed on a daily basis to the most disadvantaged in society. And through other annexes to the cathedral, the Notre Dame Hospital and Poor House, and the Home for Retired Priests, the church leaders ensured that help was given to the sick, poor and homeless, as well as to old priests. The cathedral has also performed a vital educational function, originally through the sermons given by the priests. For centuries, the cathedral was the only place of learning in the city, where some of Tournay's young people were taught the basics of reading, writing and arithmetic. The chapter used to award study grants to enable the brightest to go to the great universities. Today, it continues to play an educational role through the rich store of archives kept within the cathedral. Finally, there is the important contribution made by the cathedral on a cultural level. Over the centuries, it has become a rich source of cultural heritage in fields as diverse as music, architecture, sculpture, silver and gold plating, textiles, manuscripts and bookbinding. Besides all these riches, Notre Dame Cathedral is also full of the beauties of nature. There is a font whose base is decorated with wild animals. The capitals in the Romanesque nave are full of imaginary fauna and flora. In the Saint Louis Chapel, you can see lizards, a tortoise, a viper, a squirrel. The cathedral has also been a place for communicating, where those who have gone before speak to those of us who are here today about their skill, their love of a job well done, their search for perfection, perhaps even for immortality. The main altar is endowed with a magnificent silver medallion by Lefebvre. The grisaille paintings are by Pierre Sauvage. There are more than 500 capitals, all different. Most are decorated with vegetation, but some, such as the Swan Capital, depict animals, and others portray the life of the craftsmen themselves. There is one, called For the Fallen Man, which depicts an accident which actually happened on the site. The ravages of time can be seen through the problems of stability, which are now manifest at the cathedral, problems related to the ground on which it was built. There are three different areas. The foundations of the first central area are built on limestone and present no danger for the building. In some places in this area, the foundations are resting on soft ground which rises above the limestone, which has been eroded over the years by underground spring water, resulting in subsidence partly responsible for the structural problems. These problems are evident in different parts of the cathedral, and over the years, different attempts have been made to deal with them. But these have only had limited success, and this is why a decision has been made to undertake a series of studies before embarking on a new restoration project. Over the last few years, excavations have been underway both inside the cathedral and in the immediate surrounds, led by Professor Brulé of the University of Louvain. This will make it possible, firstly, to form a clearer picture of the different constructions which were built on the site prior to the current one, 
to understand the different steps in the construction of the present cathedral and to place all these within what historians call the cathedral quarters. Plans are currently being reviewed to open the excavations to the public. Another way of finding out about the cathedral, how it was built and maintained, is through the abundant cathedral archives. For several years now, there's been a convention between the Walloon region and the University of Louvain, giving access to these archives for research purposes, and the third and final stage of this study is currently underway. At the request of the Walloon region, a study of the cathedral's stability has also been carried out, which will make it possible to identify in detail the problems in the different parts of the cathedral and to decide what measures need to be taken where. In 1995, a decision was made to measure the movement of the main parts of the building. To do this, invar thread measuring equipment has been placed in the most critical section. The measures are taken using inductive transducers attached to thermal probes which are linked to a PC which records the measurements automatically. This technique makes it possible to measure how much the building is moving. All this work shares the same objective, to get to know more about the history of the cathedral, to ensure that it is preserved and to define how best to go about restoring it. A scientific committee has been established to coordinate the studies and to decide on any further research that needs to be done. This committee will also lay down the criteria for selecting the team that will head up the restoration project and be responsible for monitoring the work once it is underway. So, it looks as if this striking cathedral, for all its 500 years, is getting ready to launch itself into the third millennium with renewed vigour.